Well, take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, we continue this morning going through Luke's account of the growth of the early church. If you're using a black Bible from the pew in front of you, it's page 920. Acts chapter 12, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 19. Will you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we praise you that you haven't failed us yet. That's the testimony of these pages of your word. It's the testimony of our own lives that you have been faithful. Father, your power knows no end. And so we come now dependent upon your Holy Spirit to understand, to to see the truth of your word and to live according to it. And so would you please fill each one of us with your Holy Spirit that we would worship you and glorify you. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, this past summer in the month of August, my family and I, we took a trip down to Gulf Shores, Alabama. We got in the car and we drove down and before we went to the beach, we stopped in Mobile. Mobile, Alabama, there on the bay in Mobile is the USS Alabama. Perhaps you've been there. It's a battleship from World War II. It weighs 45,000 tons. That's 90 million pounds. It is raw power. It has nine guns on it that can fire a 2,700-pound shell 23 miles. Think about it. That's like launching a Toyota Corolla from the parking lot to Wentzville. (laughs) That's what the USS Alabama can do. It's power on display. But our passage today recounts God's power on display, His power to grow His church, and the USS Alabama pales in comparison to God's power. So let's read Acts 12, 1 through 19 as we consider how does the Lord prove His power to grow His church. Acts 12, verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made for him to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, And sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. 
When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he, as Peter, went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Brothers and sisters, we have a passage that proves the Lord's power to grow his church. But how does he do that? Well, in the first place, he does so by his divine providence. Look back at verses 1 through 5. Herod the king, this is Herod Agrippa I, grandson of Herod the Great. He's the Roman governor of Judea. He's killed James and imprisoned Peter to satisfy the Jewish people whose power was challenged by Christ and his followers. And it takes place during the Feast of Unleavened Bread or, or Passover. And this would have been an especially opportune time for Herod to, to do something to win the favor of the Jews. And so, a tenuous time for followers of Christ. And so, Herod, recognizing this opportune time to gain favor, he murders James and he imprisons Peter. One apostle is dead, one is imprisoned. A powerful statement from a powerful human. And yet, not even this was out of God's providence. This had already been predicted. If you look in Luke chapter 21, Jesus says these very words speaking to his followers, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. In Matthew 20, the mother of James and John, the very James that was just martyred, asked Jesus that her two sons sit at his right hand and at his left hand. And what does Jesus say to this mother who doesn't know what she's asking? You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, you will drink my cup. Jesus had predicted the martyrdom of James. He had predicted the suffering and opposition that his followers would encounter. This is not outside of God's providence. Are you familiar with Mike Tyson? Mike Tyson, one of the best boxers ever in the history of the sport, known to be unusually strange, but even the unusually strange people have moments of wisdom. Mike Tyson at one point said this, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So many people stood in the, in the ring with Mike Tyson, had a plan, and then got punched in the mouth, and the plan changed. <laughs> this is a punch in the mouth to the church. One apostle's dead, one's in prison, 
but the plans of God don't change. God's providence is still in this. It's not predicated on the acts of men. Rather, our God reigns and rules over the acts of men. It's always been the case. It was the case with Herod's actions, and it's the case with every detail of your life. God's divine providence is one way in which He proves His power to grow His church. Nothing from the Supreme Court, nothing on Fox News, nothing on Channel 5, KSDK, is a punch to the mouth of God. One quick note about Peter. Peter's in prison, but think back with me to when Jesus called him to be an apostle. In Luke 5, when Peter, James, and John were called by Jesus to follow him, Jesus displayed his power through a mundane task of fishing. All of these fish showed up in their nets, and Peter, recognizing that he was in the presence of true power, says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Do you remember Jesus' response? Do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. Do you think Peter remembered that? Do you think Peter was in prison and he remembered the words of his Lord? Do not be afraid. Believer, do not be afraid. Everything that happens to you is part of the providence of God. Proverbs 3, 25 and 26 says, Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. The Lord proves His power by growing His church through His own divine providence. Well, in the second place, He does so with, with His heavenly hosts, Let's look at verses 6 to 11 of what happened when, when, when Peter was in prison. In verse 6, actually in verse 4, you, you read there's four squads of soldiers. That's 16. 16 soldiers in this case. And you go down to verse 6, and Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, and he was bound with two chains. And there were sentries guarding the door. And then in verse 6, on that very night before Peter's likely execution, don't you think Herod was asleep, confident that what he had planned the day before was going to take place when he woke up? But on that very night, on that very night, behold, an angel shows up in the prison cell with Peter. And Peter shocked. He's not sure what's going on. Wouldn't you be? It's dark. You're asleep. Maybe you're cold. I don't know. You're certainly not comfortable. And this light shows up. And before you is a heavenly host, an angel. He's thinking he has a vision. And what does the angel do? The angel proceeds to unfold a divine rescue plan that doesn't require blowing anything up or knocking any guards out. The chains fell off, the doors open, and they walk out. That's the power of the heavenly hosts of your God. Now, one quick note on miracles, because we would consider this miraculous, would we not? One note on miracles. Let's consider miracles to be the interplay of the divine and the human. When God the Creator interacts with His creation, there's miraculous things that are going on. It's always happening. But in this instance, the curtain opens especially wide, and we have the presence of an angel showing up with Peter in his jail cell to rescue him. A recognition of the interplay between God and His people. When we were considering moving to Spain 
There was another family in our church back in Memphis. Uh, He and Crystal and I grew up together in the youth group. I mowed yards with Daniel throughout high school and college, and Daniel got married to a woman named Katie, and we started talking about uh, our desire to be missionaries with Mission to the World. And one Wednesday night, after a Wednesday night meal like we have down here, and the news had become public, and the excitement of the church started to build, I drove home that night with the family, and I just started chuckling. (laughs) I started laughing, because I couldn't believe what the Lord was doing I couldn't believe what he was doing. You see, the Lord and his heavenly hosts are always at work in the affairs of men. Sometimes we see it clearly, sometimes not so clearly, but it's always happening, and we should always be asking, Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing? So let me ask, are you looking for that interplay. While you haven't been rescued by an angel from a jail cell, the interplay of God and His, His, His power in your affairs and in the affairs of this world is always taking place. His heavenly hosts are always roaming, doing His bidding. They are His servants. Or are you like me? Do you dismiss the links in the chain of the events of your life as just naturalistic happenings, cause and effect, forgetting that that entire chain of your life is upheld by God Himself. You see, it's alongside His heavenly hosts that God proves His power to grow His church. 2 Corinthians 10 says, for though we walk in the flesh we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. (laughs) We're flesh. We sit on hard pews, and yet we have divine power through the Holy Spirit. We have divine emissaries, the angels of God, working His plan out perfectly. So, brothers and sisters, you don't fight alone. You're not by yourself. The gates of hell cannot stand against the advance of the kingdom of God. For the heavenly hosts of the Lord Almighty wrestle with you. So, how does God prove His power to grow His church? By His divine providence, with His heavenly hosts, and through the prayers of his people. Look back at verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Look at verse 12. What were Peter's brothers and sisters doing? Verse 12, where many were gathered together and were praying. From From beginning to end of this episode of Peter's imprisonment, you have the prayers of God's people that he would act. From beginning to end, they're earnestly praying. The church was gathered together to pray for the needs of the body. It's corporate prayer. They're in one home, not isolated by themselves, but together feeding off of each other, understanding that where one might be weak, the other is strong, but together you pray to the Lord to act. After my senior year of high school, my family was going through a particularly difficult time, and folks were praying. The church was praying. And in my childhood home, when I would come down the stairs and I'd walk around to the kitchen, the first thing on the right as I entered the kitchen was the refrigerator. And like any refrigerator, it's got things stuck to it with magnets. Well, that particular time of life had a a map of the United States on it. It was one my mother had printed out, and she had taken a yellow highlighter, and she had colored in every state in which someone was praying for our family. Almost the entire map of the United States was covered because people, God's people, were praying for our family. That was in 2001. It's no different in this year when Peter was in prison. God's people are are bathing his church 
in prayer. So pray together, y'all. If I pray on my own, it may be last like 20 seconds and I'm off to the next thing. When I'm sitting with someone else, there's, there's concentration that takes place. Pray together. Join together. Many of you are already doing this. We have revival prayer on Sunday mornings. There's a Monday afternoon ladies group that meets in, 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 in the conference room and they pray together. They also leave a bag of M&Ms behind every week, which always gets eaten and needs to be taken away. But they're praying together. People are joining together to pray. If you're not doing that, find a group. Let's highlight every aspect of the ministry of this church with yellow highlighter, that we're praying over it, that the Lord would be pleased to use our prayers to grow His church. So how does the Lord prove His power to grow His church? By His divine providence, with His heavenly hosts, and through the prayers of His people. And lastly, we see that the Lord proves His power to grow His church for His own glory. Look at verses 13 through 17. After Peter realizes what had just happened was no dream, he's in the middle of the street, in the middle of the night, he makes his way to the house where folks are praying. He knocks on the door. Rhoda, the servant girl, can't believe it. She runs off, forgetting to even open the door. The folks inside doubt that their prayers have been heard, let alone answered. They said, no, that's just his angel. That's just Peter's angel. Well, they're amazed when Peter walks through the door. They're amazed. Why were they amazed? Because God's glory had been on display, especially so in this rescue of Peter. And so in verse 17, after... Peter recounts what has happened. He tells them, motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison, and he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. We need to hear of God's glory at work. It's encouragement to us as believers. It's it's pointing those who aren't yet Christ's disciples to the glory of God the Father. People need to hear of his glory. And so Peter tells them to to tell James and the brothers what God has just done. And in verse 19, it finishes with, then Peter went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. I would imagine when he got to his destination, he didn't forget what had just happened. He certainly recounted the divine rescue that had taken place days before. And I would also imagine that he didn't stop with that miraculous rescue. It wasn't as though he recounted the angel in his cell and said, that's all there is to the story. No, he probably went on to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The good news, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus was probably quickly followed as Peter recounted the glory of God. So the Lord proves his power to grow his church for his own glory. And to contrast it, we have in verse 19, Herod's response to Peter's rescue. Herod puts to death the centuries. When you compare that to the work that God has just done, how petty and impotent does that feel? The Lord has just miraculously rescued Peter, and here Herod, who has human power, pales in comparison and does a petty and impotent thing of putting someone to death. The interceding work of God is by far more powerful than Herod ever was. I'm sure you're familiar with this, but there's a type of argument that it's the lesser to the greater. You you prove something um, that's, that's small or perhaps insignificant or less in order to to prove the truth of something that's greater. 
It's a type of argument, the lesser to the greater. How much more you hear in Scripture? It's a type of argument. How much more? And so while Herod showed human power, how much more power does your God have to grow his church? A couple of weeks ago, the local missions conference, the theme verse was Mark 5, 19. Jesus, having cast out demons from a man, tells him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. You see, it's for the glory of himself that he works throughout the world. And as followers of Christ, we're to proclaim that glory like we're doing here this morning and like we need to do when we leave here this morning. We proclaim the glory of God's work in the world. They all recognized Peter, the brothers and sisters gathered together to pray, how much more mercy they had received because the work of Christ. And so they wanted to tell it, to speak of his glory. So recognize God's work, look for it, rejoice at it, and report on it. The Lord receives the glory for his work of redemption through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Well, the USS Alabama was commissioned in August of 1942, 77 years ago. There was a prayer as part of that commissioning service, and it included this. We pray and we celebrate this glorious day with deep gratitude May we ever draw our strength and support from you, whose perfect love is our peace and whose peace is our power. That man standing on 90 million pounds of power recognized that it held nothing to the power of God to grow his church. And so, brothers and sisters, we have power we have power to proclaim the glory of God and to trust that he is more than powerful to grow his church. And so will you pray with me to that end that we would be servants of God to help grow his church? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are God, that you're Divine providence is always at work, that nothing happens outside of your control. We take great comfort in that. Father, we praise you for your heavenly hosts that are doing your bidding and ministering and overseeing. We thank you for how you work in the affairs of man. Father, we thank you for the grace that's ours in Christ Jesus. We thank you that the life, death, and resurrection points to your power to grow your church. And so today, would you find us faithful to proclaim your glory to those we interact with? We thank you for the privilege to do so. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.